Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Emil Bryant. I am with Soft Power Solutions, and we welcome you to YLI Country Club today as we go into the Demilitarized Zone series addressing security concerns on the Korean Peninsula and the Asia Pacific region. Today's topic is politics and fallout in the post Park Geun Hye era. So I'm going to introduce the director of, for the Asia Pacific region, Ms. Charlene Ostrov, who is from Soft Power, and she'll get us started today with some opening remarks. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. All right, all right. It's going to be a beautiful day. We're going to uh, talk a lot about very important topics and learn from each other. It's very exciting to see all of you here. As Emil said, I'm Shirlene Ostrov, and in one of my roles, I'm the director for the Asia Pacific region for Soft Power Solutions, which is a native Hawaiian owned uh, organization, a uh, small business. So on behalf of the president of that organization, uh, retired Air Force uh, Brigadier General Skip Vincent, who uh, was held up in Africa today, um, and together with the International Lawyers Forum from California, we welcome you. This is the first of a series of dialogues, panel discussion, and symposia. Um, I would like to make sure that we um, recognize um, some uh, folks in the audience. Um, we see with us our city council chairman, um, Ron Minor. I saw him, yes, right here. <laughs> Councilwoman Ann Kobayashi. <laughs> Councilman Trevor Ozawa. Oh, I, he was a rock. He will be coming. <laughs> and Councilwoman Carol Fukunaga. So. Thank you very much. So the intent of these series is to have, as Emil said, frank and open discussions on current and very pressing security issues and concerns in the Korean Peninsula, which extend um, to the Asia Pacific region. At the same time, we also want to promote awareness, simulate, uh, stimulate debate, and gather opinions from the general public. So the United States being a um, Pacific nation and a treaty ally of South Korea and four other counties, I mean, countries in the region is directly affected by what goes on on the peninsula. Hawaii is the closest state to the Asian mainland, thus any threat coming from Eastern Asia is also a cause for concern for those of us who live here as well. With that in mind, I want to emphasize that the importance of filling out the critiques in your folders. Um, there's a critique form which we want you to use, and more of these dialogues are being planned all over the country. Um, and what we would like to do is get your candid feedback on this particular event so that follow-on events can become better and better. Um, we're putting a lot of work into this and we would like to be more effective in providing you and those who go to the other um, symposia um, relative information on subjects that address your personal concerns. So with that said, let's get started. Again, we're happy that you're here. We want to challenge our experts. Um, they will challenge us today and we look forward to a great presentation. Thank you very much. Our first panel is national security. And <clears throat> our goal in under, is to understand the things that affect our nation and South Korea, what we should be doing about them, what we are doing about them, and have, again, a discussion about what it means to be secure in this era. We have three presenters today. We have um, retired General uh, Pyong Wan He. Uh, from the Republic of, Army, uh, Re Republic of Korea Army, Mr. Carl O. Schuster, retired United States Navy captain and a lecturer at the Hawaii Pacific University, and uh, a paper from Sung Chu Han, a major general retired from the Republic of Korea Air Force. 
Um, General Hahn could not be present today, so I'm going to read his paper as one of the entries into our discussion, and then I'll let the two presenters who are here begin their remarks. Uh, the next voice you hear after me will be General Hook. Major General Hahn writes, <clears throat> North Korea's successful test of an intermediate range ballistic missile, which came in the wake of President Trump's threat of a major, major conflict, if the North did not cease and desist, means the possibility of a war with Pyongyang is growing. In preparing for such a conflict, war planners in the Pentagon have focused on the threat posed by tens of thousands of North Korean heavy artillery pieces perched in the hills above the demilitarized zone, which could rain down on Seoul in a matter of minutes. In response, the US has deployed THAAD anti-missile systems in South Korea to protect soldiers and civilians against an artillery and missile barrage from the North. But the real danger may not come from above, but below. North Korea is the most tunneled country on the face of the earth. The nation is littered with thousands of underground military factories where soldiers take an oath to toil underground for the rest of their working lives, marrying within their units and even raising children underground. One soldier who escaped such a facility told the Los Angeles Times described the factory where he worked as a prison, adding, everything is underground. This is how we hide from our enemies. It may be also how they attack their enemies. While North Korea uses tunneling to protect its nuclear and missile programs, it has also been tunneling as part of an invasion plan for South Korea. The North has been preparing for decades a tunnel war that could see tens of thousands or more North Korean soldiers attacking South Korea, not over the DMZ, but under it. We know that North Korea has been tunneling under the DMZ into South Korea since the 1970s. In, 1970, in November of 1974, an American officer was killed by a booby trap as he was investigating the first such tunnel discovered since the armistice. That tunnel had the capacity to support one North Korean regiment an hour, or between 10,000 to 30,000 troops. A few years later, a second tunnel was found that was twice as wide, making it large enough to transport tanks, artillery, and heavy weapons. A third tunnel was found a few years later, and a fourth in 1990. At the time, Officials estimated there could be as many as 16 other undiscovered tunnels. That was nearly three decades ago. There is no reason to believe that North Korea stopped tunneling under the DMZ since then. Quite the opposite. If, North, if the North's advances in tunneling technology have matched this nuclear and ballistic missile advances, it is likely that dozens of tunnels have been built stressing much deeper into South Korean territory. How might North Korea use these tunnels in a conflict with the US and the Republic of Korea? In 2013, the regime of Kim Jong-un released a propaganda video laying out its plans for a three-day war to subjugate the South. On the first day of military operations, the video declared, one of the objectives is to capture 150,000 American citizens who are living in South Korea as hostages. While the 150,000 figure may be bluster, the question remains, how could North Korea take such a large number of American hostages. The only way to do so would be from underground. Indeed, one North Korean defector, a former intelligence official with direct knowledge of the North's tunneling plans, told CNN that a network of tunnels had been built linked to targets such as the US Embassy and the Blue House presidential compound. The tunnels, he said, were connected to the sewer systems attached to these and other targets, instead of directly to the streets, in order to avoid detection. North Korea has a long history of using kidnappings as a military tactic. If the North sensed that conflict was imminent, a tunnel network would allow North Korea to preemptively seize American citizens, both military and civilian, and bring them back to North Korea to, for use as human shields. The North could also use the tunnels to target senior leadership of the South Korean government or for abduction or assassination. Or North Korea could use the tunnels as part of its invasion plan moving its forces underneath US and South Korean forces so they could emerge behind enemy lines and attack everything from harbors to airfields, naval bases, radar stations, missile sites, and power plants. If, as we suspect, the tunnels are large enough to move around armored units, the North could send hundreds of thousands of combat troops into South Korea underground. It is now impossible to know how many tunnels exist, but we have documented cases of dozens of unexplained sinkholes and road cracks that are consistent with underground drilling, including near the US military installations. A few years ago, 
Residents in downtown Seoul complained about underground vibrations, even though there were no nearby subways. But when we drilled holes and tried to lower cameras down, the cameras were met with explosions that blocked the drill holes. It is my belief that North Korean soldiers blew up the tunnels to avoid detection, just like they blew up the tunnel uncovered in 1974. While some dismissed the tunnel threat, until recently it was hard to believe that a Mexican drug lord named El Chapo could, without detection, build a mile-long escape tunnel under a maximum security prison complete with lights, ventilation, and rail tracks. If the Sinaloa cartel could do this, imagine what the North Korean regime is capable of building without detection. In 1974, Kim Il-sung declared that one tunnel is more valuable than 10 atomic bombs. Almost three, days, three decades later, we know that the regime he founded has built the bombs. We should not be surprised to find out it has built the tunnels as well. Again, that is from Major General Han, retired Republic of Korea Air Force. And with that, I pass the mic over to General Ha. Distinguished guests from our most important area, the United States of America and its citizens, Attorney Sudok Jang, our international lawyer, from who made this meaningful even possible today. Soft Power Solution and the Pacific Forum of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And last but not the least, our concerned fellow countrymen, the Korean immigrant. I am deeply honored to be invited to this distinguished forum to give opening speech today. And I would like to extend a wholehearted welcome to everyone in this room for participating in the symposium. My name is He Peng Hwan, a retired Lieutenant General from the Republic of Korea Army. For 38 years of my service in military, I always promised myself that I will never let another Korean war a tragic war between once unified, but now divided people with opposing ideology. To ever happen again, however, if by any chance in case of such a horrific event, I strongly resolve to defend my home. The land of free and the country, which was built on the foundation of democratic principle the Republic of Korea. Most of all, the same with my other fellow countrymen who live through the war, I also felt that the most important thing is to never forget and be grateful for the sacrifice of veterans of the Allied forces, who bravely fought to protect the freedom of Korea people and uphold the U.S.-Korean alliance which was built on such a solid foundation. As years passed by since then, I have witnessed the people of my country were starting to show sign of influence from the communist doctrine by Kim Il-sung of North Korea. What Kim Il-sung insisted was that the Korean Peninsula must be unified by its own people under the rule of communism. The communization scheme of South Korea was based on the false allegation from the North that the South Korea is colony of the United States. And in order to liberate them, National Security Act of the South and the U.S.-Korea Alliance. <clears throat> must be abolished, and the two countries should form a confederate state. Back in 2002 years, when I served my country as a division commander, many shows, especially newly drafted ones, seems already affected with the communist idea. It was due to the fact that a part of the National Security Act which prohibit nomination of hiring of communist and their family members to build the position was abolished during President Chen Du Hwan's administration era. 
Since then, those who secretly engaged in communist activities were naturally introduced to the society, thereby influencing people with their ideas. When I retired from the service in 2008 and went to put on my civilian clothing, I saw many fellow people in Korea, including those who were in leadership in many areas seems impacted by North Korean's propaganda. Threatened by the dangers through held by radicals, well, many were not even radicals, they were common people, just like you and I. I strongly urge soldiers under my command to study the base of national security and the importance of democracy. I even wrote a book on why two Koreans should unite quickly. As you ask why, so that the people of Korea can live happily ever without the threat, aggression, or oppression from the Kim family who rules the northern part of the Korean Peninsula with their iron fist. Then I reached my limit on persuading people to get a hold of themselves and watch out for communists. It was hard without political influence. So I went ahead and formed a political party and ran for the National Assembly, which I failed magnificently just after two months of the founding the party. The party had to go, but then the time for decision came. A presidential election between Park geun a former president now, and Moon Jae-in. I could not give my spot to Mr. Moon because I believe he was spearheading the abolishment of the National Security Act. And also, I believed was a strong spot for the North Koreans' demand to form Confederacy under their own terms. I believe that the candidate Park would protect the democratic nation of South Korea, which she did with many initiatives that helped my country to find its identity in its roots and values freedom in democratic society. Once she became president, the Park dissolved a political party well known for the pro-communist activities and imprisoned Yi Seok-hee, who was a mastermind behind many incidents. She leveled the teachers' union as illegal entity which taught communist ideas to our young children. She prosecuted the head of the Labour Party who was behind all of those violent illegal protests. She closed down the industrial complex in any in the city of Gaesung that operate in cooperation with the North and the data uncovered that proceed from the business North Korea took as their share was used to spot their missile and nuclear development. She agreed with the US to place terminal high altitude area defense system to brought into Korea and also put many effort to strengthen US Korean alliance. One day print the bar closed print the Che Sun Shil's incident were highlighted by media which called for mass public demonstration for the impeachment of the president. From an observer's standpoint, I feared that this opened a door for communism to take hold more deeply in my country, which we dread for many years. I am concerned that it may reach to maturity in very near future. I believe that to participate in a protest for impeachment of the president based on a groundless accusation was wrong. 
and to keep silent during the public outcry was a cowardly act. So I began to participate in anti-impeachment protests. When a number of people joined for our cause reached 3 million, I saw the Constitutional Court would rule in favor of the President. However, when the court ruled unanimously to impeach President Park, <clears throat> I realized this country was no longer governed by just the law. Then, the moon, Mr. Moon became President of South Korea from the special relation held to replace President Park. We, the patriotic citizens of Korea, are peering for the future of our democratic country. The Korean people fought for freedom and democracy for the past 70 years against the communist North. Yet now we have this international, internal conflict our people seems divided by pro north or anti north groups. We even lost our president from the illegal impeachment that seems to spot communists in the South. The Republic of Korea, my country, has risen from ashes and rubbers of painful war and to join the developed nation in the world. South Korea, one of the poorest countries in the world at the time, has now become a nation wide known for its development and advancement in technology and science. Now that country, the very country, the veterans of allied forces sacrificed to protect the lives in the threat of becoming a shadow of great share on the influence from North Korea. At all costs, the powerful U.S.-Korean alliance must be preserved. And in order to do so, the United States must keep its calm and re-evaluate any sort on North Korea and U.S. peace treaty talk. We also must help President Park, who was wrongfully impeached and now imprisoned for trial. This is what we who firmly believe in freedom and justice, equally should proceed and the goal which we should aim for. Of all, I strongly believe that in order to protect the integrity of South Korea, a democratic nation, is fight to preserve the U.S.-Korean alliance and the strength is ever more, even more, as we all as we all say all the time, let's go together. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any question? Thank you. Thank you, General Ha. We appreciate that, those remarks. And remember, this is a dialogue. These are presentations that are prepared remarks, and then the discussion can come at any time. So if you have a question after a presentation, please feel free. The next voice you hear will be that of Cap uh, Captain Schuster. Oh, we excuse me. Good morning. Uh, if I may, I'm a typical ex-military guy. I'm into PowerPoint, although it came into being just before I left the military. Uh, but you'll notice very quickly that I do not have an artistic eye. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. This is just some basic facts about North Korea. Their total active duty strength, as you notice, about 1.2 million. Most of their equipment is either obsolescent or obsolete. And if I may build on uh, the point of General Han's paper, they have been tunneling since at least 1959. I say that because that year, a group from Hanoi met with Kim Il-sung, and he said, if you intend to fight the Americans, you need to tunnel everywhere you can, and protect everything you can because they rely on concentrated artillery fire and air power. And if they can't find you, they can't hit you. Also, the Americans are very casually sensitive. So don't, the mistake they made in 1950 was they fought us our way. 
You need to bring them to fight your way, and tunnels are the way to go. If you ever go to South Vietnam, you will find they put an entire village under the DMZ they used as a logistics center. And if you go to the tunnels of Tu Chi, they go down 130 feet. It is as large as a 14-story building. And we only knew about the first two floors until 1989. So it'll give you an idea of how much they believe in tunneling, or at least how much they took North Korea's recommendation to heart. You'll notice the reserves, too. They can mobilize it to varying degrees of combat readiness up to about 18% of their population. So air superiority won't be a problem for us, but they know that. They have been anticipating a war with someone who has air superiority since 1952. So with that, next slide. Now, their military is conscription-based, universal conscription for men starting at age 17. Annual call-up is somewhere between 77 to 100,000. They have selected call-up for women. It is a 10 to 12-year service for the military males. And for the women, it can be that much, but sometimes it's only five years. Often, it's a lifetime commitment, depending on what your specialty is and a variety of other factors. Navy is much shorter as is the Air Force. You'll notice reserve service in the military is until you're the age of 40. You then go into the people's militia until you're the age of 60. And they have stay behind networks should they ever be invaded. So you'll have both a conventional fight to the front and a fight to the rear. Next slide, please. Now take a look at these equipment. I won't read it to you, but you'll notice they have a large armored force, most of it obsolescent, most of it obsolete but we won't be fighting in the desert. The fighting will be at close range where the advantages of our firepower are not necessarily in our favor. They believe in what's known as grab the belt buckle, fight close. So they try to get inside the safety zone of our artillery. That is their goal if they fight us. They have 88,000 special purpose forces. About 10% of them are female. And they often, about 1,200 of them, are estimated to be assassins. They can walk up to you, they look innocuous, you're dead before you know that they're angry at you. In fact, uh, Kim Jong-un killed his brother with two of these young ladies. Sometimes they station them in a country for up to a decade before they use them. So, Air Force, once again, all but 44 of their aircraft are obsolete, as is most of their Navy. SSB refers to their one ballistic missile submarine they took a regular small attack submarine and put a missile tube in it. Don't know how useful it is. They have had a successful test and it didn't sink it. If you're on the receiving end, whether it's a great missile or a good missile is almost irrelevant. And one problem with old equipment is it does have a dud rate, but if I may uh, express something from my experience in Bosnia, a 20% dud rate means 80% of the rounds around you detonate. So if you're on the receiving end, the dud rate's almost irrelevant. Next slide. Now, the key thing that we'll be talking about today is the threat beyond the Korean Peninsula. They have short-range ballistic missiles, which they test fairly regularly. Typically have a range of about 300 miles. That's one of the threats facing South Korea. Uh, however, they've been working on medium-range and intermediate-range missiles now for almost 25 years. They have 10 launchers for the Nodong-1, which is a medium-range missile that can reach at least the southernmost points of South Korea and possibly, depending on who you read and believe, Japan. They also have been testing intermediate range missiles, the Hwasong-10 and the Pukuksong-2. Uh, we think, depending on, once again, who you read and believe, Jane says they think they have 10, others say they only have two. Point is, is they don't yet have an effective delivery system, but it's obvious they're working on it. A Chinese expert on CCTV last year said he thinks they will be able to have one ready by about 2021, 2022. Cyber threat. We all focus on the missiles because they're obvious, they make great propaganda films, but in fact, the, Chinese, uh, the North Korean Cyber Warfare Force has been active since 2004 and has roots going back to the mid-1980s. And depending on, again, on who you read and believe, between eight and 10,000 strong. Next slide. This gives the missile ranges. I want you to notice that the intermediate range missiles can reach Hawaii. 
Now their tests, and you'll see in the next chart, their tests typically, they use a high loft maneuver rather than range to test the missile. They do that because if it fails, you can say it was a satellite launch, that's one reason. The other reason is they think it's replicating the problem. You don't have to shoot over someone's territory if you launch it several hundred miles into the air and it crashes, say, 600 miles away. Uh, but there is a guidance difference between a high loft maneuver for a short range shot or medium range shot than an actual intermediate range or ballistic, intercontinental ballistic shot. And the number of tests has been growing. It used to be two or three years between each test. Last year, I think they did five. Uh, they have done four already this year. Uh, some debate over whether they were medium range or intermediate range missiles. Uh, but it's obviously an active program and it highlights what you can achieve with ruthless prioritization of your resources. This regime sucks up about 80% of that country's resources for its own security forces and military. The remainder of the population is barely subsisting. <coughs> Next slide. This gives you some details on their short-range missiles. These are the ones that you'll see if you're South Korean. Uh, they have several hundred, we think. Next slide. Most of them are, in fact, all of them are truck mobile, so they're going to be hard to hit. Medium range, the Nodong-1 is a medium range missile. It's the one they most often fire. It's also the one they export to Iran. In Iran, it's called the Shabazz series. And the Iranians have shot a version of what they imported from North Korea out to a range of about 1,500 kilometers. And so many defense analysts believe that North Korea can successfully put a missile at least that far. Next slide. These are the intermediate range missiles that are in development. The Hwasong-10, sometimes referred to as the Musudan because of where it's usually launched from. And the Pukuk-Song-2, which they say is an extended range version of the missile that goes in their submarine. You'll notice they reach out between three and 4,000 kilometers, which means they can reach Guam. May have a chemical warhead, we don't know. Most people believe it's high explosive. Next slide. And these are the intercontinental missiles that they've been testing over the last two to three years. You'll notice the Wasong 12 has about 8,000 kilometers range. Wasong 13 is a little shorter. And the Wasong 14, also referred to as the KN08, can reach out up to 10,000 kilometers or is estimated to have that kind of range. All of them are on a transportable launcher, which means they can move them around from tunnel to tunnel. They are liquid fueled, which means they take some setup time. But if you remember from Desert Storm, of course, technology has advanced since then. Hitting a mobile missile launcher before it gets the missile off is a big challenge. <coughs> Next slide. They have done two submarine missile tests. One questionable whether it was successful or not. One they say was successful. It certainly flew out and landed in the water. And the submarine made it back without any major damage. And it has a range of about 1,200 kilometers, the Puxong one. Next slide. They also have cruise missiles, mostly for anti-ship purposes. That's what they fired most recently. They put three of them uh, out into the Sea of Japan. They launch them roughly every year. Uh, you'll notice they usually time them for when periods of tension. For example, we press was reporting we had three carriers off Korea. Suddenly, they do an operational test of three anti-ship cruise missiles. You'll notice that most of them are older. However, the ones they supposedly fired uh, back in April were uh, supposedly new, and they may be. They have a range of about 300 kilometers. Uh, it's a slow-moving missile, so it's in the air a long time. And they fly comparatively high, about above 20 meters in altitude. So, and they have a huge radar cross-section. So they're fairly easy to detect and shoot down if you detect them and you're ready. Next slide. Now, the theater... Uh, defense system that we deployed to South Korea works somewhat like you see here in this drawing. You have a phased array radar, which means there's just a few, mic a couple of microseconds between each transmission. So you don't have the problem we used to have with the rotating antennas. Uh, there's a command system that has the software. Uh, the thing to remember about anti-missile defense versus engaging an air breather is an anti-missile defense the computer logic and the algorithms are different. And the reason is because of velocities, 
A ballistic missile flies along a fairly easily predictable path that would risk the integrity of the missile if it changes radically, whereas an air breather can change radically. And so we do vertical smooth, we do what's known as guidance smoothing to engage an air breather. You have to shift to a ballistic algorithm when you engage a missile. That's the only difference. The beauty of SAD over Patriot is it's a larger missile, it's a faster missile, and it has a quicker reaction time. And so when you get a kinetic impact and you understand math matters in missile things, you're delivering more energy into the target. You're also hitting it instead of going with getting proximity. And that means less of the incoming missile makes it into the target area. One of the problems we have with Patriot and anti-ballistic is you hit the missile, we take out the warhead, and then one and a half tons of missile body goes flying and falls somewhere. Doesn't hit the target, but if you're in the vicinity of the body of that missile when it lands, you're impressed. Next slide. Now, I'm gonna go into their cyber warfare force. This is a group that's been in development since at least 1986. That's when they stood up the, what's known as the command automation uh, school. Uh, Kim Il-sung, or Kim Il-chung, is the founder of it. He was looking for ways to extend North Korea's reach. Wasn't a lot of resources. And you need to understand, when he made that decision in 1985, most people agreed there were no computers in North Korea, no computer networks, and no programmers. And yet he decided to build a cyber warfare force. He did it by hiring out of work Russian software engineers. Now, his son, Kim Jong-il, the late Kim Jong-il, was the primary sponsor. He took a personal interest in it and was actively involved. It was considered a special asymmetric warfare force and they enjoy an elite status in North Korea. And it's grown from two programmers in 1990, and that's how many we absolutely could confirm they had in 1990, to eight to 10,000 last year. They conducted their first major attack that we could trace back to them against South Korea in 2004. They went after South Korea's wireless military's wireless networks with about 300 attacks. They hit 33 sites successfully. In those days, not a lot of us had much security on our computer systems. But they're best known for the November 2015 attack on uh, Sony Corporation. Uh, in which they took out almost three terabytes of data from Sony. Emails from agents, actors, company officials, movies. Uh, suddenly everyone was awake and we knew North Korea had a cyber warfare force. Only professionals were tracking it before then. Next slide. Now this is their cyber warfare structure in 2009 the Cyber Warfare Force was scattered out among different agencies. Then in 2009, they were consolidated. They came under the Reconnaissance General Bureau, the same group that runs their special forces, the same group that runs their assassination squads. And there's an additional group that's surfaced recently, Group 180, which isn't on this chart. Their specialty is hitting banks and financial institutions to steal money. That is the group that took $100 million out of Bangladesh's treasury. They're the ones that are tasked with gathering funds for the government, for the regime. Keep in mind, the regime's number one priority is its personal survival. And Kim Jong-un has an additional priority above that, his personal survival. Remember, the retirement plan for old dictators is not a lucrative one. You get a small plot about six foot in length and about six foot down. Not a good view. So, a lot of focus in this. You will notice how the offices are divided. The command automation department develops the software. And they separate the offensive software people from the defensive software people and from the command control and communications people. Each developed separately with very little interaction between them. That may be a good thing, but from a security perspective, it is a good thing. But it makes you a little inefficient. You'll notice the general staff has a hacking unit two, although it works differently. Unit 204 and unit 310. One is responsible for tactical propaganda and psychological warfare. The other is more strategic. 
Now, one thing that Kim Jong-un has missed that his grandfather was well aware of, he, had, he advised the North Vietnamese, when you fight the Americans, you've got to be, appear sympathetic to them. Americans have trouble fighting someone they hate. They don't hate. So Ho Chi Minh, in their narrative, he was given two days to learn about Thomas Jefferson, and in his first interview, he spoke about he was a big fan of Thomas Jefferson. He had never heard of Thomas Jefferson until two days before the interview. And we bought it hook, line, and sinker. That whole narrative was manufactured in the two weeks prior to the interview. Now, Kim Jong-un obviously didn't get the memo. He keeps talking about how much he hates us and how much we hate them. He's probably doing it for domestic reasons. So he's gotten a little bit away from the strategic message. But they are constantly trying to work a message into South Korea and among expatriates that life is not so bad in North Korea and that South Korea is a toady of the United States, and they make the connection to the historical period when uh, Korea was a colony of Japan, and they say that the Americans are just a little different, just a different face, different language, but nothing's really changed. And so this is their cyber warfare. Don't picture them as just a bunch of hackers. They run the gamut. They steal money from banks and financial systems. They go after command and control systems. They push propaganda. They push very attractive videos <clears throat> of beautiful young ladies working out in the field and how wonderful a life they have and ra da 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 and the women on the field probably do. Uh, but for the 80% of the population that isn't on that field working out in nice outfits, life's just above starvation. So, next slide. I would be remiss if I did not mention the assistance they get from China. Most of their early software engineers were trained in China. And <clears throat> most of their early software people were familiar with Apple because that's what, they, that's what they were trained on. Linux and Apple. They didn't get into Microsoft until the turn of the century. You will notice where they're located. <clears throat> Unit 110, which is the offensive part of their hacking outfit, operates out of a hotel in Xinjiang. There's over a hundred of them in that hotel. So China can't say they're not aware of their activities. They at least know they're there. Hewlett Packard did a study of this group and actually took pictures of the hotel they're in and they're going in and out of the hotel. Don't know how they got away with that. It's in, uh, it's in the province of Xinjiang and I'll, uh, I have the report in my desk. It's, um, I forgot the name of the hotel but it starts with an H. Uh, but it's a large hotel that caters mostly to um, Chinese officials. But you'll find a lot of North Koreans in there. Not all of them are with Unit 110. <clears throat> There's also, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 121. 110 operates down around Qingdao. Now 110 is a group that goes to trade fairs, studies overseas. Uh, you'll run into them if you go to the uh, Technical University in Basel or Geneva, you'll also run into them in Barcelona. <clears throat> they study software, they're very good students. Uh, if you talk to them, if you encounter one and talk to them, they sound like they're from California. So it makes it very hard to recognize that they are not from California. Uh, they know American football better than most of us and they know our constitution better than most of us. So they come across as an educated American unless you really make the conversation last a long time. So they also have a group down in Guangzhou who often visit Hong Kong. Anyone care to guess why they go into Hong Kong? It's where they buy a lot of their software and a lot of their computers. So it's a large program, perhaps not as large as ours, but when you consider how small their GDP is in comparison to ours, as a proportion of national effort, it is significant. Next slide. Here's the selection process. I was struck by the similarity between it and the way the old Warsaw Pact countries used to pick their Olympic athletes. They start looking at them at the age of five to seven years old and start selecting them somewhere between that age and nine. And most of them are between seven and eight years old when they go into the program. And the minute they do, their parents get privileged, the private apartment, the kids go into a very demanding program, and as long as they're in it, their parents lead a very good life. 
and so do they. By middle school, they start selecting them for the schools that are best suited for their talents and kind of a balance between their loyalty or perceived loyalty and their talents. And a unit called Unit 34 is responsible not only for finding and recruiting these children, but tracking them throughout their entire cyber career. And Unit 34 is a part of the, a very important part of the Korean Workers' Party. Next slide. What I've done here, this rather complicated slide, gives you an idea of the progression of a North Korean cyber warfare based on what's available in the public domain as best I can assess it to be. They have, you'll notice, four universities there. Wonsong Middle School is the primary um, education training ground, but it's also the primary evaluation center. How well they do there, what they do well in there, determines where they go next. Those who are good at just software and perhaps aren't aggressive uh, uh, but are very good at programming typically go to the automation university and wind up in one of the bureaus responsible for developing software. If they are very good with math and numbers, they might wind up in the command and control and communications unit. If they have a talent for hacking, they're going to go to 180 or 212 or one of the organizations that is involved in hacking. If they have language skills, they could wind up in Unit 91, which does open source intelligence network. They pull in data that's openly available in the public domain and send it up the chain, if you will. So not everything they do is evil, covert, or espionage related. A lot of what they do is just what's out there for anyone. Their Office 91 is very similar in terms of its operations to what I do. Not that I'm evil, but there's a lot out there in the public domain that you can pull in quickly if you know how. And then you'll notice that how they do in each progression determines where they go for the next one. And they, those who are the best get a lot of refresher education, a lot of fresher training. You'll encounter them in German computer schools, Swiss. Some have even gone to England. They're very international, multilingual. They are the best of Korean, North Korean society. It's a major investment coming at the expense of the common people. I'm one who believes that sometime in the next four years you're going to see a general with that background. Because he will have progressed through the system and there's two sides to their system. One is what little internet connection they have, they don't even trust the members of their own Korean Workers Party. <clears throat> Kim Jong-un has supposedly set up an office that monitors the internet communications of his own people those close to him. So it kind of makes our email leak problem kind of pale by comparison. We're not going to be shot by a bunch of anti-aircraft guns if we send the wrong email. For them, it's painful. So as you can see, it's a comparatively large program. They've spent almost 30 years developing it. It's probably nearing maturity if it's not there already. And the WannaCry, anyone here remember the WannaCry uh, malware of about a month ago? It's been traced back to North Korea. They launch most of their attacks out of China, and they don't come at you directly. They go through whatever there's a hole in security. The Sony attack, for example, was routed through Mexico, Argentina, Peru, the United States, and across into Sony. So tracking it involves both finding out where it came from and look for what's known as the forensic computer evidence. They do have a tendency to use the same um, malware segments in their attack computer programs. But now that they know that's how they're getting caught, that may change. We'll see. It's a game. Well, that's a horrible way to put it. But what are they going to do next? How will they do it? Can we get ahead of it? Those are all the things that Cyber Warfare Command is probably worried about in tracking. They will look at ways to get into your air defense systems. They were very impressed 20 years ago with how we supposedly got into the Iraqi air defense system through cyber warfare. 
they would love to replicate that. And indeed, some people believe the 2004 incident was an attempt to see how you go about doing it and whether they had that capability. So with that, I think that's it. Any questions? Bottom line? Yes, sir. Uh, it's certainly a horrifying story about cyber war. This uh, Korean Workers Party, you mean the party in the north? Yes, sir. Uh, Korean Workers Party is nominally the Communist Party that okay, uh, supports that feudalistic regime. This situation? For 30 years, accumulation of the educational scheme, mm. how would you suppose we can reverse it? Uh, I think it's possible. I think the, the problem is, is how do you get the word to the people? The number of people that have, actually have personal computers in North Korea is very limited. Their access to radios, telephone, everything is very limited. So getting to them is a challenge. The other thing too is, is, is if you develop any kind of dissonance from the regime and you're discovered, you know, it's an instant trip to the rubber truncheon disco. You're going to dance to a tune they beat into you. And that serves to deter people from being open about whatever they may feel. Would you see, just for one more question, any balance between, let's say, their effort to build the warfare versus our effort in the South? We are trying to educate young people to be more nicer, more reasonable, and not to get into too much shit. A cyber war type of things. Now, how are we going to either synchronize or rec reconcile these two efforts? Uh, two things. I think it's not impossible to be a polite and courteous person and be assertive and uh, effective in fighting for your country, whether it's online or physically. Uh, there is a difference, however. When you're fighting physically, as, as uh, you probably know from your own experience, you're fighting for the people around you as much as for your country. In cyber warfare, it's much more individualistic. It, very often, uh, it is a contest in the mind of the hacker between the hacker and the hacked. How do you use that to motivate your computer experts to do that? And I would argue that wherever there are children studying computers, there's somebody with an interest in hacking. Just my thought, I have nephews and nieces, they have to program my phone for me. So just look for a nine-year-old if you need that. Thank you for the answer. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. I have a question real quick. Do you believe they have the ability, this is the million dollar question. Yes, sir. Do you believe they have the ability to take down the electric, electrical grid in the United States? It's five five grids, okay, and with a, a coordinated attack, could they take down the electrical grid and cease everything in America? It's and, my uh, belief that at the moment they cannot. I, however, I do think they could do a lot of damage. Uh, going after one sec, keep in mind, ah, dig it, keep in mind that the North Koreans get what they get by focusing. Focused efforts. They're kind of equivalent to the Israelis. They can't attack a wide variety of targets all at once, but they can focus on one target set very effectively and have a secondary target set. So it's my belief they could cause us problems. They could disrupt the electrical grid. They could black out major areas, but take down the whole grid, I don't think that is possible at the moment. I do think, however, that they, are, they would consider it during a period of tension and crisis and we should be prepared for it, should. And they're not the only ones looking to do that, by the way. Russia and China also are aware of that vulnerability. One other question. Do yes, you sir? think they would possibly launch an upper atmosphere military, I mean, a nuclear explosion to also knock out, uh, instead of doing it sort of uh, through a cyber attack, through a thermonuclear device in the atmosphere that could take out all the electrical sy system and magnetic pulse? Uh, the problem with that is 30 years ago that was eminently possible. But as a result of the Soviets running experience, experiments on that in the 70s, many of our systems are hardened against that kind of pulse. Uh, and so uh, it would be a challenge. The other problem is you detonate a nuke over the United States, it's clear who launched it. And the odds of our not doing anything about it are quite small. Remember the North Korean regime's number one priority, survival. 
Detonating a nuke anywhere near us is not the path to long life and happiness. We would retaliate. Okay. Sir, in the back. Right. Uh, excuse Yes, it's... Um, so I had a question concerning China. Um, so you said, yeah, so um, some of the units in uh, concerning cyber um, warfare are based in China. Yes. Is this salutary neglect on China's part, or is it an active role of the Chinese government? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and one of, the re one of the challenges as you look at China is there is the Politburo policy, there's the high-level policy, and there's a lot going on underneath that the Politburo doesn't have direct control over. And so it could be it started as an assistance effort to maintain influence with the regime. And now, what do we do? No communist Chinese official wants to be remembered as the guy who lost North Korea. Mm. <clears throat> and so everything they do with North Korea is based on a calculation of what's the impact on China and what are the consequences for the North Korean regime. They fear regime collapse in North Korea. If they cannot control the outcome, then they don't want it to happen. And right now, I don't think they believe they can control the outcome of a regime collapse or regime change. That's just a thought. And just a quick follow-up, sorry. Um, do you also think that would the, would the Chinese government back North Korea in a shooting war like they did in the 50s? Yeah. I think that would be a last resort. Uh, keep in mind, again, that the Communist parties, if you read their military doctrine, the number one priority is defense of the party. Uh, and the Chinese take a historical view that we sometimes don't, and that is they've looked at the uh, past of China, and they realize that every time a dynasty has done an ill-advised foreign military adventure, the dynasty's collapsed. And they consider themselves, in a historical context, a form of dynasty. So a shooting war is something they might do, but it would be only once they were confident they could contain how long it lasted and where it was conducted. Thank you. Sir. Those are great. Yes. Uh, uh, you obviously uh, are very much knowledgeable in, uh, in this area of security issues. And uh, on behalf of the Hawaiian people here, where we are living, would that international, I mean, intercontinental uh, ICBM reach Hawaii in any day? I think as you look at that weapon system, mm -hmm. the regime sees these weapon systems first as a political weapon to deter us. Mm -hmm. The North Koreans believe uh, that the United States is not very aggressive <clears throat> when we can be reached. Uh, the other thing uh, they uh, believe is uh, when we waited until Gaddafi didn't have nuclear we a WMD program before we hit him. Mm. So that feeds into their narrative, if you will. For their perspective, having the weapon during a crisis, they could threaten us and it would have an impact on Hawaii. Right now, we get a large number, most of our tourists come from Asia, and we also get a large number from Europe. Uh, during a crisis in which either Japan or Hawaii is threatened by a missile strike, just a threat would deter some people from coming here. We would see an economic impact fairly quickly. Not immediately, but fairly quickly. The key thing is how long would it last? If nothing happened in three or four weeks, they would come back. Thank you. Please, feel free. Come to the microphone. Uh, good morning. Uh, this question is for Lieutenant General Ha. Um, he, uh, he stated that uh, he believes a quick reunification is a, a key to happiness. And I was wondering his thoughts on how and if he believes the current administration will detract or contribute to the reunification process. So um, earlier, I believe you stated that uh, you believe a 
quick re reunification is the key to happiness uh, for uh, inner Korea or inner Korean affairs. Um, how do you see this going about? Or what are some of uh, like to get your insights on how this, uh, how you believe uh, quick reunification can happen? And uh, the second part is, uh, will the current administration will either detract or contribute to the reunification? Could you clarify which administration, South the Korea or U.S.? Oh. No, oh, sorry. So the current uh, South Korean administration. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 아까 말씀드릴 때 uh, 빨리 통일하는 게 이제 그 uh, 행복하기 위해 좋은 바, 방법이라고 말씀드렸는데 그 어떻게 uh, 하면 uh, 그렇게 네, 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 바로 네. 통역 좀 하세요, 우리 정 대표님. 대단히 어려운 문제지만 어, 통일하는 방법에는 크게 세 가지가 있습니다. 첫째는 군사적인 공격을 통해서 김정은 정권을 붕괴시키고 우리 체제로 통일하는 방법이 있습니다. 끊어서 말씀하실 것 같습니다. 통일하기 위해서. 네? 네, 끊어서. 통일하는 방법이 세 가지가 있는데 첫째 하나는 군사적인 공개. 밀리터리 어택. So there's uh, in his opinion there's there's three um, parts to to how uh, we can achieve uh, a quick reunification. The first part is um, a military a military attack. 그런데 그것은 자칫하면 지금 남북한 군사력이나 주변국 군사력을 볼때 잘못 시도하면은 우리 민족의 어떤 공멸을 가져오기 때문에 시도하기는 대단히 어려운 방법이라고 그랬어요. So obviously with with any type of um, military option um, there's a huge risk to to the civilian population and so uh, it's not a very desirable option. 가장 좋은 방법은 북한 김정은 체제를 붕괴를 시키고 어, 그것은 내부 구대타나 또는 공작에 의해서 김정은 김일성 체제를 붕괴시키고 거기 새로운 리더가 나오도록 해서 대한민국으로 통일해 오도록 하는 그 방법이 있다고 그랬어요. So, uh, <웃음> A better option would be to um, somehow uh, facilitate the collapse of the uh, Kim Jong-un regime, um, whether it's through uh, a coup or um, just to, to get it out of there. This would be our Korean government, and our Korean government, and our Korean government, it can be done well. 지금 문재인 정부처럼 북한을 엄성적으로 지지하는 이런 정부 하에서는 그 방법도 상당히 어렵다. 그래서 강력한 보수 우익 정권이 들어섰을 때그 방법을 쓰면은 통일을 한 하나의 방법이 될수 있다 우리 해서. So the issue with the, uh, the option he just uh, mentioned right now is. Um, fact that the moon regime is in place. Um, if you had a conservative um, administration, it would be more feasible. Uh, but with um, moon in power, um, it becomes a lot, a lot more difficult. During Kim Il-sung's death, the Republican Party was killed. At that time, if our leader had such a strong desire, he would have the opportunity to win the election. He would have won the election. So we actually, that opportunity was actually uh, missed. There was um, a time when um, probably could have happened, um, but it's it's passed us by. 문재인 정부가 들어서 나서 그 방법을 추구하는데 어려운 상황이 되었다. Yeah, with the the rise of the uh, Moon regime, it's um, that type of option is is very difficult. 또 하나의 방법은 북한을 자유민주주의 시장경제 체제로 
개방 개혁을 시켜 가지고 같은 자유 체제로 통일하는 방법이 있다. Uh, thirdly, um, we can try to change, uh, try to introduce a, a free market economy, um, a more um, capitalist economy um, into North Korea, and uh, through that, kind of introduce um, change. 그런데 그 방법은 시간이 많이 걸리고 그렇게 하려면 결국은 우리가 북한에 들어가야 되는데 북한을 포용하면서 들어가야 되는데 한국 내 친북 반북 세력의 그 갈등 때문에 사실상 이 방법도 추진하기가 대단히 어렵다고 그랬어요. So um, it, this option takes a lot of time. It's not going to happen um, overnight or you know even in um, a few years. Um, and you also need access, obviously, into the country to, to introduce economic reform. Um, but that's not really happening um, right now either. 그 입장에서는, 입장에서는 시간이 걸리더라도 북한을 개, 개방시키는 방향으로 나가면서 나가면서 김일성, 김정일 정권을 전복시켜서 우리 체제로 통일해 오는 그런 방법을 나는 추구해야 된다고 생각합니다. Uh, so in, um, in, in General Ha's opinion, um, uh, we have to work to open up North Korea, um, and it's going to take time. Um, but while we're working on getting North Korea to open up, also work on um, getting the Kim Jong Un regime out. Uh, wait for a moment. Wait for a moment, please. Wait for a moment, please. Uh, 그 방법을 추구하는 데 있어서 가장 중요한 것은 우리 대한민국 내부의 북한을 추종하는 세력들을 제거시키는 문제와 우리 한미 동맹을 견고히 해서 한미 간에 잘 협력을 해서 그런 정책을 추구하도록 하는 것이 대단히 중요하다. So a, a key part of um, accomplishing that um, the strategy that he uh, General Ha just laid out uh, is to eliminate um, in South Korea um, the basically the pro North Korea uh, element and strengthen uh, the Korea US alliance. Kim Il Sung on Kim Il Sung on Kun Sajoro, to Uriel Kanchebul Lere Bonesa, Bukan Chijan and Jungur Mandras, Choka Tongir Halan, Jung Chagul Kujuni Chujin Hennande, Uri Damingu Chido Jadaran, Kyongje Bunyungman, Irumian, Tongir Halsuitan and Kurun Sengage, Chinedaga. 사상전에서 지금 현재 우리가 굉장히 어려운 상태에 와 있다. Um, so in North Korea they've been thinking about um, you know how they're going to implement um, their agenda. You know they've they've put a lot of thought into it. They've been working towards it. Um, but from South Korea's perspective um, we've kind of not really um, Put in, the, put in the effort and, and a lot of time, we've allowed a lot of time to pass by um, without really being able to seize upon um, opportunities. Any question? Yeah, Eugene, thank you very much. Well. Uh, first, a, a comment rather than question. It's very difficult to interpret, but General Ha made several important points that were skipped over in the interpretation. One of them that I noticed was mentioning when Kim Il-sung died in 1994 that South Korea had a chance to unify, but the South Korean leadership and the president did not have the strong resolve to do it. And that's an interesting point, and so I wanted to make sure it was heard. And he also made the point that a big problem today, although it was mentioned later, was in how to take care of North Korea 
the difficulty in South Korea of the fighting between so-called pro-North Korean and, how should I say, conservative forces interested in unification. The fight, internal fighting in South Korea is a barrier, ideological differences, for South Korean leadership to get the resolve to unify North Korea. Another important point that I think I'll talk about again. Uh, the question I have is, it's a little bit of a question and a comment. I work with many South Korean companies, and when President Park was inaugurated, all of my clients, large corporations and small ones, felt the urgency to make a plan for how they would contribute to some part of economic development in North Korea if there was unification. Usually not only thinking of how can they extend their own industry into North Korea, their own business, but also what can they invest in that would be promoting that would, they would be able to take to North Korea and develop even such things. For example, one of my clients was interested in so-called smart agriculture. So it seems to me, I, this is, maybe this is a comment, not a question, but I think if you look at the South Korean government, South Korean academics, and South Korean business, there's been an immense amount of thought and preparation to how to make the North Korean economically successful if there's unification. So I'm, could you explain again about why you feel that South Korea is not prepared or hasn't thought too much about unifying with North Korea? Thank you. Hmm? <laughs> 어, 지금 이 순간도 어, 예를 들어서 마이크 녹화할까요? 예. 박근혜 대통령께서 취임한 그 직후에 지금 저분이 그 거래하시는 한국에는 수많은 기업들이 어, 통일이 이루어진다면 통일에 대한 기대감을 가지고 어떠한 자기가 기여를 할 것인지 심지어 어떠한 투자를 해서 어, 자기의 사업과 어떤 기업의 모습을 어, 북쪽에다가 또 이렇게 심을지에 대한 그런 어떤 기대감을 가지고 움직인 적이 있었는데. 지금 우리 장군님 말씀을 좀쭉 들어보는 과정에서 통일에 대한 방법론이 몇 가지가 좀 나오고 있지만 어, 현재 상태를 봤을 때 통일의 가능성에 대해서는 이렇게 썩 긍정적이지 않다는 뉘앙스를 좀 느끼고 있는데 왜 한국이 이렇게 준비가 안 되어 있다고 보시는지 또 혹은 현 상태에서 정말 그것이 힘들다고 보시는지 그걸 좀 이유를 말씀해 주실 수 있으시겠습니까? 에, 결국 통일을 요소 하세요. 영어를 요소 하는 게 나겠다. 통일을 이루기 위해서는 지도자, 대통령의 그 통일에 대한 관점, 생각이 대단히 중요한데, 저... 우리는 자유, 어, 자유 체제로 통일을 해야 되는데, 우리 자유민주주의 시장 경제 체제로 통일을 해야 되는 거예요. 끊어서 해야 되는데, 끊어서 하겠습니다. 지금 문제, 어, 끝까지. 네. To carry out a unification. The perspective of a leader is crucial in accomplishing uh, such an end goal. Uh, to the South Koreans or to the world, the, the desirable, ideal form of unification is through a free, peaceful uh, unification and free market uh, economy. Mm. Now, with the recent election that took place, who we have seen, and Moon was elected, the people who voted for Moon, they are thinking their perspective is to oust the influence of the United States in South Korea or in Korean Peninsula, and they accomplish the uh, unification through what they know, what they uh, claim as a uh, more of the federated unification led by North Korean efforts and initiative. But the unification is Kim Il Sung. It is the first stage of unification. Our free democratic society is not able to accept it. Now that methodology was uh, conceived by Kim Il-sung 
where he saw that as a process and a stepping stone to accomplishing uh, turning entire Korean Peninsula to a red state, the communism state, and through those uh, unification methods, the federated method, uh, the end goal is to communize entire entire land. And for us, the South Koreans and the free world, it is not acceptable. Uh, 그래서 우리 대한민국 지도자와 국민들이 우리 자유 체제로 통일하겠다는 하나로 뭉쳐 있으면은 대북 포용 정책이든 군사적인 공격이든 또는 공작이든 붕괴든 어떤 정책을 할 수가 있는데 우리가 두 쪽으로 나눠져 있기 때문에 그 어떤 정책도 쉽게 채택할 수 없기 때문에 통일이라는 문제가 어려워졌다고 그랬어요. If the South Korean government or even the people within are homogeneous in their thinking and action, it will be easier to accomplish uh, South Korea-led or US-influenced uh, uh, free, peaceful unification. However, the very fact that Korea in, in the south, southern land of the entire peninsula is in the divisive mode, the likelihood, likelihood of accomplishing it uh, is becoming uh, dim than bright. So today we symposium을 하는 근본 이유도 또 여기 참여한 우리 정미용 대표나 전하 어떻게 하면 현 시점에 자유 대한민국을 잘 지킬 것인가 또 우리 체제로 통일할 것인가 하는 것을 여러분과 같이 고뇌하기 위해서 왔고 여기에는 한미 동맹 미국이 자유 대한민국을 확고히 지키고 자유 체제로 통일하겠다는데 같은 생각을 해 주기를 정말 어떤 면에서 호사로 이게 자리 왔다. Well, many of the speakers here today are here to uh, share the thoughts and ideas about how to actually bring those uh, possible prospect of unifying the Korean land and have U.S. interest and U.S. Uh, uh, engagement involved for the benefit of the United States as well and possibly we seek some solution through the uh, conversation today. Because the United Trump President and the United States government Eh, 해야 될 것은 두 가지인데 첫째는 한국을 절대 포기해서는 안 된다. Well, there are two things Mr. Trump, the President of the United States and the people of the United States can possibly do. The first thing is to never give up South Korea. Uh, 앞으로 문재인 정부 또 그를 추종하는 세력들은 미국 사람들의 자존심을 상해하는 많은 행동들을 할 텐데 거기에 분노하지 말고 거기에 동요하지 말고 대한민국을 확고히 지키겠다는 신념을 가지고 한미동맹 주한미군 한미연합소 체제를 확고히 지켜주기를 일차적으로 바란다. The moon for those of you who's not clapping yet it's okay it's coming for Moon and his followers, um, they will intentionally provoke and hurt even the pride of America. They will do it intentionally. So don't get hurt. Don't get insulted. They playing their psycho psychological warfare on you and never give up the alliance between two great nations in terms of military, economic exchange, and social and cultural exchanges because we are going together. Fantastic. And we have time for one more, que one more question. One more question. One more question. One minute. This is, this is, a, this is a comment for Captain. Uh, oh, wait a moment. <laughs> He's on the second, 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 second thought. Second, second if you can give him a little yeah. moment, please. The second Kim Jong-un and the American government are not going to be able to Second of all, don't be easy on Kim Jong Un when he is trying to pull you, the United States, into the negotiation table. Uh, don't be easy on him. He's, he will do everything to manipulate, deceive, and you know hurt you. And um, we have a superior mind to you know conquer his. Uh, uh, gameplay. Thank, thank you, General Ho.
One last comment for Captain Schuster. Because we have so many lawmakers in this room, I just want to give a first-hand comment uh, about how vulnerable we are here in Hawaii. I am very good friends with KPS Gill, who came here to brief Central Pacific Command. He's one of the leading authorities in the world on Islamic extremism, okay? We have a huge risk here in Hawaii because of Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is the money shot. And KPS Gill told me this, and that is a significant place to hit Hawaii. And we are a target, whether it's, you know, we're a soft target for Islamic extremism, but I really, in my heart of hearts, think, really think that uh, the North Korean regime would like to hit Hawaii because of the Pearl Harbor significance. And KPS Gill always felt that way. And, uh, you know, I highly respect him. So anyway, just a quick comment, because a lot of people here are in denial. And you want your economy to collapse, just the threat, it will keep tourists off. I get emails every once in a while say, is it really that bad in Hawaii? Do you, are you going to get hit by some type of nuclear device? So that's just a commentary. Right, thank you for that. We're going to take a break. Our next